you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me, please, to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. It is believed that this was the Zechariah of which Jesus spoke, which Israel murdered. And if that was the case, the last four prophets, if you call Jesus such, that were sent to Israel, they murdered the last two. To the great prophet Zechariah, the Lord spoke and said, the fourth chapter, beginning with the fifth verse, Zechariah 4 and 5, then the angel who talked with me answered and said unto me, Know ye not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, not by human might, nor by human power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Glory to God. By my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And I want to use that for a subject, preaching tonight up for a few minutes. By my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I can remember the first time that I felt the power of God. I was only eight years of age. Just a few weeks earlier, the Lord had saved me in a strange way and in a strange place. A Saturday afternoon, standing in front of a moving picture theater, about to buy a ticket to go in to see Roy Rogers or somebody. And the Lord spoke to me, waiting for that t ticket window to open and said, don't go in there. Give your heart to me, for you are a vessel to be used in my service. I, I was only a child, but I knew it was the Lord. I know some would scoff and say, well, how could God speak to an eight-year-old? Well, God could speak to anyone. Amen. He spoke to John the Baptist when he was in his mother's womb. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I feel that. And the ticket window opened, and the kids started walking forward to buy their tickets. And the Lord spoke to me the second time and said, don't go in there. Give your heart to me, and I want to use you in my service. I had laid my quarter down on the little projection there where you get your ticket and I grabbed my quarter. <laughs> and I remember the lady, her name was Mrs. Green. She said, well, Jimmy, are you going or not? I said, no. I went down to Volt's Drug Store on the corner. And I said, I want the tallest ice cream cone you have. <laughs> now, today they got 99 flavors. Then they had three, vanilla, chocolate, and, and strawberry. That was it. They piled it up on a cone, and I stood on the corner, and then I felt it. Eight years old, it was like 100 pounds lifted off my shoulders. I, as an eight-year-old kid, I didn't know that much about sin, and I've often wondered, if I felt like that at eight years old, what must that drunk feel that his whole life has been wasted with alcohol or drugs or whatever the case. And then he comes to Jesus and is born again and his world changes. It's the greatest thing in the world. There is nothing like it. Let me tell you, Jack Daniels cannot compete with it. Pabst Blue Ribbon cannot compete with it. Marijuana cannot compete with it. And I, I knew I was saved. I got home early, and my mother, she knew when to expect me, and I was an hour and a half early. She said, you didn't go to the movie? I said, no. Why? I said, the Lord saved me. 
just like this. She said, what? I said, the Lord saved me. She said, how? I said, I don't know how he did it, but he just did it. <laughs> and where were you? I said, standing in front of the picture show. And the Lord saved you there? I said, yeah, he saved me there. It was kind of strange to her, but it wasn't to me. And a few weeks later, in the summer months, not in school, I, I've always been an early riser. And I got, it must have been about 6 o'clock that morning. And I went into the living room. My mother and dad were standing beside my piano. I had an old upright piano that I learned to play on. And they were talking about my grandmother, his mother, my dad's mother. I called her Nanny. When I was two years old, I couldn't say granny, so I shortened it to nanny, and it stuck. And they were talking about her, and it wasn't positive. I heard my daddy say, Mama has gone crazy over religion. Now, they all went to the same church, Assembly of God Church there in the little town. But she was the first one in our family to be baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. She came back. I meant she was full of joy, full of the Holy Spirit, shouting glory to God. Everybody she saw, she told them, let me tell you what the good Lord has done for me. Woo! And my mother and dad, they thought she was fanatical. He said, you can't even get around her. She talks about Jesus. Now, they were saved. They said, we love Jesus, but there's just, just, just no sense in going overboard with it. That's a trouble with some of you. You've never been overboard before. <laughs> if some of you have wondered what a genuine fanatic looks like, take a look right here. You're looking at a genuine, bona fide, guaranteed fanatic. It's Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noon, Jesus at night, Jesus at midnight, Jesus all day long. Woo! And my mother said, and I'm listening to this. My mother said, if you get around her two minutes, she'll start speaking in that some kind of Language you can't understand. <laughs> Somehow it didn't strike me as negative because I knew my grandmother. I listened about a minute or two more and ran outside and got on my bicycle. And I rode straight to her house. <laughs> Knocked on that door. Nanny opened it. And come on in, son. I said, Nanny. Mom and Daddy says you have just received something from the Lord that makes you talk funny. I want to know what it is. Glory to God. I'm here tonight to tell you what it is. I'm here tonight to tell you what it is. I'm here tonight to tell you what it is. Glory to God. I want to know what it is. It's freeze-framed in my mind like it happened yesterday. She laughed and said, come on in, Jimmy. Let me fix me my hot tea. She loved hot tea. And she said, I'll tell you. She fixed her hot tea, sat down, never took a sip of it. <laughs> I sat on the floor looking up at her. And then she started to tell me how that Jesus baptized her with the Holy Spirit. And when she got to that place to where he baptized her with the Holy Spirit, the power of God hit her, her hands went up, and she began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And that's the first time I felt the power of Almighty God. Chill bumps broke out all over my arms. And I want to tell you this, I've never been the same since. I'm eight years old. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I just looked at her. 
I went back that afternoon and said, tell me again. <laughs> I'm serious. Sat down in the same place. She told me the same thing again. When she got to the place where the Lord filled her, the power of God hit her. Her hands went up. She started speaking in tongues, and it went all over me. Next morning, I was there at 8 o'clock. I said, tell me again. <laughs> I'm serious. I went every day for two times and several days, three times, and she told me the same story every single time, and I'd sit there and wait because I knew the power of Almighty God. And that's what the church needs. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's what the assemblies of God needs. That's what the church of God needs. That's what the Baptist needs. That's what the Methodist need. Glory. And I wanted what she had. I got so hungry for it. And one morning, just a few days later, we were having morning prayer meetings, and I was kneeling on the right side of the altar in that little tiny church. And I, I'm about to tell you something I don't understand myself. But it was like all of a sudden I was in a pool of liquid light. I could see it. I couldn't. It was like there's no such thing as liquid light that I know anything about. But it was like it was liquid light. And I began to speak with other tongues. Eight years of age. Hour, two, three hours later, my mother and dad took me home and I was still speaking in tongues. For two or three weeks, I couldn't speak English except at particular times. I'm serious. My mama sent me to the post office. <laughs> Those days, she sent me for a three-cent stamp. Now, if you're, if you're below 25 years old, you don't know what a three-cent stamp is. But I remember laying the nickel on the, on the counter. They've turned a museum into that post office now, but anyway. And he looked at me and said, what you want, son? And I tried to tell him I wanted a three cents and started speaking in tongues. Now, I'm eight years old. He looked at me. When I was born, my hair was almost snow white like it is now. It's gotten back like it was when I was a kid. <laughs> and and uh, it was blonde. It's white now. He looked at me, and I didn't look foreign. He had the funnest look on his face. He said, son, I didn't understand you. What did you say? I tried it again and started speaking in tongues. And he said, I'm sorry, young man. I can't understand what you're saying. I tried it the third time and started speaking in tongues again. He just stood there. We stood there looking at each other. I grabbed my nickel. That was the evangelist in me. Don't leave a nickel left. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to shout. Somebody ought to praise God. And I got home and mama said, where's my stamp? I said, I could speak English now. I said, I didn't get it. She said, what do you mean you didn't get it? I said, I, I couldn't tell him what I wanted. I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I would start speaking in tongues. <laughs> she said, boy, if I send you many more places, they're going to think we're all crazy around here. <laughs> no, she didn't say that, but <laughs> she thought that. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I've always regretted it. I, I didn't mean to get into all of this, but the morning my mother, you know, be careful what you tell people that you won't do with the Lord. Just be careful that you tell them. We had a lady in our church, she would get a little loud at times. 
And my mother and dad didn't like it at all. And, and uh, there were a couple of other things they didn't like. One brother would get happy and run around the building. They thought that was a little bit much, you know. You just don't do that. They were good Baptist Pentecostals, understand? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so my mother made some wisecracks about them doing that. I was a kid. I heard it. I didn't pay attention to it, but I heard it. And so that morning we was having prayer meeting at the church. And of course, my mother and dad, they never missed a service. They never missed a prayer meeting. Anyway, my cousin, Jerry Lee, came and, and, and a couple of other little fellows and wanted me to go play with them. And I went with them. We just played cowboy and Indian or something. I was always the sheriff. And <laughs> Poor, poor Jerry Lee was always the Indian, and I always killed him. <laughs> but anyway, we were playing. I don't know. It was a block, at least, well, a half a block anyway, from the church. Jerry Lee, myself, and a couple of other, whoever they were. And I heard somebody holler. That far from the church, I heard them holler. Now, some of you northerners don't know what the word holler is, but <laughs> it's shouting loud. And I remember Jerry Lee said, it's coming from the church. And it embarrassed me. I mean, it embarrassed me because it was mama. I knew it was mama. <laughs> Glory! Hallelujah! I knew it was mama, and I heard a holler again, and he said, it's coming from the church. I said, oh, no, it's a car wreck. That's what it's been. It's a car wreck, and somebody's <laughs> holler. But that morning, the Lord baptized Mickey Gillies' mother with a baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues baptized my mother with a mighty Holy Ghost and she began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Glory be to God and the Lamb forever. And she did everything that she had said she would never do. She ran around that church. I'm serious. I, didn't, I wasn't there, but they told me about it. And like I said, the shouting match, I heard that. <laughs> then there was an old man in the church. He was blind. And his hygiene wasn't too good, you know. And my mother felt that our church was a little bit too uppity for somebody like that to attend. Am I making any sense? You know, he, he, was, he was not good enough to come to our church. She didn't say it that way, but that's what she meant. You said your mama must have been something else. So are you. <laughs> and uh, when my mother came to, she came to speaking in other tongues with her arms around that old man hugging his neck. <laughs> Glory! Hallelujah! 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 Somebody shout! Somebody praise God. Glory be to the Lamb. Our world changed. I mean, our world changed totally and completely. Before I get into this message, you say you're not into it yet. <laughs> Let me lay a little groundwork here as to how the Holy Spirit works. How the Holy Spirit works. Were you to ask most Christians, now I know most of you would know, but most out there, if you ask them, how does the Holy Spirit work? They wouldn't know what you were talking about. They would just look at you strange and what do you mean how does he work? He just works. <laughs> no, he doesn't just work. Think about it. The Holy Spirit is God. And if he did what he wanted to do 
and just worked as some Christians think, there would never be a Christian that would ever fail the Lord ever because he would stop you, bam. Now let me say that again so you'll understand. He just works. No, he doesn't just work. If he did, he would use his power and only have to use a tiny bit of it to stop you in your tracks when you were about to do something that's wrong. But have you noticed he doesn't do that? If you're stupid enough to do it, he'll let you do it. Well, I'm gonna have to be a little planner because I can tell most of you have never sinned so you don't know quite what. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, He's God, but he will never override your will. But here's something else. He won't stop you from playing the fool. If you want to climb as, as uh, who was it that wrote Pilgrim's Progress? If John, when John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress and talked about climbing Fool's Mountain, every Christian has climbed Fool's Mountain at one time or the other. And... Uh, but thank God at the same time, he doesn't leave you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. He won't leave you. I said he won't leave you. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. For lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now, how does he work in your life? Romans 8 and 2 tells us, I'll start with Romans 8 and 1. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Here it is. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of life is the Holy Spirit. The law of that's a law, not the law of Moses. It's a law devised by the Godhead in eternity past. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit, everything done on this earth pertaining to the Godhead with one exception has been done by the Holy Spirit. Whenever God brought this world back to a habitable state in Genesis 1, it said the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. And the moving of the Spirit is the beginning of life. Well, I want you to get that. The moving and operation of the Holy Spirit is the beginning of life. Everything done. You can put it this way. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit they all own the, the entirety of the universe, but say it this way to understand it. God directs God the Father. God the Son is the architect. And God the Holy Spirit is the builder. Let's say it again. God the Father is the owner. God the Son is the architect. And God the Spirit is the builder. Praise God. We are a habitation of God through the Spirit, and He's building something in us. He's building something. The only thing that the Holy Spirit did not do was Jesus Christ and the price He paid at Calvary, but He superintended it every foot of the way. Whenever Mary conceived and the angel Gabriel said, that this holy child that will be born of you, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The first mention of Christ before the incarnation to Mary was about the cross. You'll call his name Yeshua. It means Savior. He shall save his people from their sins. Thank God he has. Thank God he has. 
Thank God he has. And the way that Mary conceived, it was nothing physical. It was all spiritual. It was the Holy Spirit that simply said, let there be. The same way that he said, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be impregnation. And Mary, a teenage girl, probably about 16 or 17 years old, was instantly pregnant. Meaning that Jesus would not be born as a result of Adam's fall. Praise God is right. The Holy Spirit superintended him all of his life. I'll preach on this Friday night, but Jesus didn't even begin his ministry until he was first baptized with the Holy Spirit. You th I'm talking about the Son of God now. And the Holy Spirit has always worked in one way, and that's by the means of the cross. You said, now, wait a minute. There was no cross up until Jesus died. All of the sacrifices symbolized the cross. They were woefully insufficient to do what needed to be done because animal blood could not take away sin. It couldn't do it. So the Holy Spirit was limited he could not come into the hearts and lives of believers in Old Testament times to abide permanently. He could with some for a period of time to help them perform the task that they were called to do. But most, he was with them, but not in them. The Holy Spirit so superintended Christ that he couldn't even die until the Holy Spirit told him to die. If I'm not mistaken, that's the ninth chapter of Hebrews. The Spirit of God told him the moment that he could die. And at that moment, he said, it is finished. And to your hands, I commend my spirit. Praise God. And he died. And the price was paid. And when he did, the veil of the temple opened. That whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. Now, due to the cross, due solely, totally, completely, absolutely to the cross, what Jesus there did, the Holy Spirit, the moment you came to Christ, whenever it was, Due to what Christ did at the cross, when you accepted him, all sin was forgiven. Now, I'm not saying it well. This has got to be said in a better way than that. You were totally forgiven. No, 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 that's, that's got to be better than that. You were not only totally forgiven, you were declared not guilty. No, 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 it's a little better than that. You were not only totally forgiven and declared not guilty, you were declared innocent. Yeah. Innocent of all charges. Innocent of all charges. Woo! Yeah. Glory to God, somebody ought to get happy. Yeah. Well, you ask me why I'm happy. Well, and I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers, that's it. And they ask me where they are. I just say, my sins are gone. Five cord there underneath the blood. I said, they're underneath the blood. I said, they're underneath the blood. On the cross of Calvary, as forecourt far removed, 
One chord as darkness is from dawn. Now love this. In the seas of God's forgetfulness, it's good enough for me. Praise God. I said, praise God. I said, praise God. My sins are gone. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. There underneath the blood, on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the seas of God's forgetfulness. And that's good enough for me. <laughs> Praise God. My sins are gone. Let, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. I can't and you can't. We're human. There are a lot of things you want to forget but you can't forget it. Now, there's a lot of things you ought to remember you do forget, <laughs> but there are things that you want to forget, but you can't forget it because you're a human being. But God has the capacity to forget. Yeah. What do you... He doesn't even remember every sin, any sin that you have committed in the past. Praise God. He forgets it as far as the east is from the west. Forget it. Forget it. And God sees of forgetfulness. Woo! Praise God. That hit me the other day. I was moaning around over something. Now, wait a minute. Y'all are going to have to handle this now. I know I can look at you and tell that you have to walk around every day doing that, trying to keep the angel wings in because you just. I was moaning around to the Lord. You ever done that? Moaning around. <laughs> I'm going to see how to say this. Because I can tell. We got at least two or three long tongue gossips in this place, I know. Something I've done way back in. None of your business, none of your business. <laughs> Moaning around. And the Lord said, what are you talking about? Yes. I said, what, what do you mean, what am I talking about? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. It's gone. 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 Hallelujah. Gone. Gone. Well, it's gone at last. Well, gone at last. Thank God my sins are gone at last. I've had a long string of that bad, bad time. But my sins are gone at last. Somebody ought to shout. I said, gone at last. I said, gone at last. Come on, play that organ, boy. Thank God my sins, they were gone, they are gone at last. I've had a long streak of that bad, bad time. But my sins, gone at last. I said gone at last. Gone at last. Thank God my sins are gone at last. I've had a long streak of that bad, bad time. But my sins are gone at last. Well, gone at last. Gone at last. Gone at last. Gone at last. Thank God my sins are gone. 
Go sit down. Forgiven? Not guilty? Innocent? One more. One more. Perfect. Perfect. Wait a minute now. Perfect. Are you going? You just went a little too far. Now that's your problem. What Jesus is, I am. What Jesus is, you are. The Lord gives you his perfection. He cannot give an imputed righteousness to sin. You say, well, now that kind of have problems believing it. I know you have problems believing it. But when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the sacrifice. Glory to God. Now, it is the cross of Christ that has made it legally possible for the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and into our lives and to remain forever. Praise God. He's there right now. And to remain forever. He only requires of you not much. If he did, we couldn't make it. But it requires one thing, and that is that your faith, your faith, your faith be exclusively in Christ and what Christ has done for you at the cross. That's it. A Baptist preacher wrote me the other day. He said, Brother Swaggart, if you were preaching this 100 years ago, the whole church world would have accepted it. But now it's a strange message. The cross of Christ has been so little preached that it's strange. Every doctrine in the Bible is built on the cross. Every last one of them. All right. That's my introduction to this message. Um, Israel, under Cyrus of the Medes and the Persians, the son of Esther, she had married, remember that king she married, and whatever the case, and they had a son whose name was, well, his name wasn't Cyrus, that was a title, but that, that name was called many years in prophecy before he was ever even born. Due to what Esther had taught him, this king, he allowed the children of Israel to go back, as Jeremiah had prophesied, back to the Holy Land. 50,000 went the first time under Ezra. When they got back, it was a moonscape. The city had been just totally, totally wrecked and destroyed. They'd been away for um, many years, and the temple had been burned and sacked and wrecked, and, and the city was just a ruin. It was a ruin. It looked like the terrible ravages of Hurricane, what was the name of that hurricane? Randy. Oh, Sandy. When they get our age, they give us a little allowance. Of course, you're about 20 years younger than I am. And uh, you saw it on TV, just a moonscape torn all to pieces. And the first thing that Ezra did, in those days, cities, no matter what they were, they had to have walls around them. I meant because of robbers, plunderers, murderers, brigands, thieves. They had to have walls around them. But the first thing that God the Holy Spirit told Ezra to build was the altar. 
I want you to think of that. The altar where they could offer up sacrifices. Before a wall was built, before the temple was built, before anything was built, build an altar. That ought to tell you something. It was telling Israel, well, Lord, we don't have a wall to keep out marauders and what have you. He said, the shed blood of the Lamb is your protection. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Build that altar, offer up sacrifices. Now, they laid the foundation of the temple, but stopped and quit. There were hindrances, there were problems that they should not have allowed to stop them, but they did. Now, let me tell you, this thing that God has called us to do, this ministry, which you are a part of, some, maybe four or five here say, well, I don't know if I'm a part of it. I've just kind of come to spy out the camp. <laughs> well, you hang around on this creek bank long enough, you're going to slide in. You just watch it. <laughs> and Satan is going to do everything he can to stop. You don't think he's going to let the gospel go over the whole world without trying to stop it. He tried to stop every way he could to stop the Jews from building their temple. And God, here's the strange thing about it. God, for the first time, referred to that land as the Holy Land. When they had that multi-billion dollar temple, and the city was one of the most beautiful in the world, he never referred to it as the Holy Land. But here they are with the city torn all to pieces, and their homes were tents. And yet God calls it the Holy Land. Why? When all hope of the flesh dies, then God, the Holy Spirit, can go to work. Praise God. And they didn't start back to building that temple until the two prophets, Haggai, and Zechariah started to prophesy. When Haggai and Zechariah started to prophesy, God even told them, he said, I want you to go to work, go up and, I mean, they, they didn't have silver and gold, but go build, the, get the temper, timbers and bring them down here and start to work on this temple. We've got to get it built so that you people can worship and I can come in your midst and bless you and help you. Then he told them, he said, you do it. And from this day, I will bless you. Now think about that. From this day, mark it on your calendar, he said, I will bless you. He said, otherwise, you're not going to be blessed. But if you do what I tell you to do, you'll be blessed. Now, there was another king over the Medes and the Persians. And Artaxerxes was his name. Isn't that a name, Artie Erxes? <laughs> Makes you erp thinking about it. <laughs> Artie Erxes. Old Artie boy. <laughs> some of the doubters in, in the Holy Land, some of the Samaritans that didn't want to see that temple built or anything built, they wrote him a letter and told him, these people, you've got to stop them. And so he writes a letter, and this is the mightiest monarch on the face of the earth. This man is the head of the Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. The, 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 the capital city is Shushan. It's, it's modern-day Iran. We're still having problems with them. Persians. And so he wrote a letter and said, stop all work on that temple. And the retractors and detractors came and brought the letter and held it out and said, stop all work. You cannot do anything because the king of the Persian empire has said, stop. 
But when God tells you to do something, you don't stop. The only thing that God doesn't have is a reverse. It's forward. Red Sea out there, go forward. Glory to God. Jericho out there, go forward. The Jordan River flood tide, go forward. It, are, you, are you getting what I'm talking about? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Somebody said you're taking on too many cables too quick. You're going on too many satellites too quick. You can't pay for it. Paying for it's not my department. Paying for it is his department. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. We're going to start translating in Russian in just a few days. We've, we're on a satellite there now that covers half of Russia. We'll go on another one next month that'll cover the other half of Russia. Why? We've got a story to tell. We've got a song to sing. We've got the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No reverse. And uh, he said, stop, cease. And the Lord, I don't have the time to develop this. I'll, oh, boy, it's, I got to quit. But it's, uh, it's past my bedtime. <laughs> And uh, the Lord gave Zachariah some of the strangest visions you've ever seen in your life that he'd ever seen. Had a big candlestick with a big bowl at the top, seven lamps on it, seven pipes, golden oil running through those pipes. Now, what in the world was that? And he asked, he said, Zachariah, do you know what that is? Zachariah said, no, I don't know what that is. A big golden candlestick, seven lamps on it. I could tell you what all that means, but I won't take the time. And a big bowl at the top with oil. Oil's a type of the Holy Spirit. But I did say all of that to say this. He was telling Zachariah, there's coming a day that I'm going to fill my people with the Holy Spirit. And they will have an unlimited supply. It'll flow from heaven into their hearts and lives constantly. Flow. It's flowing right now. It's flowing right now. I said it's flowing right now. It's flowing right now. Thank God it's flowing right now. I was going home this afternoon and and uh, Donnie was closing his service. I was listening to it over radio, praying for people to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God filled that car. I mean, just filled that car, that oil just pouring in. Poor guy had to stop for a red light, and I'm squalling and praising the Lord, and people in other cars staring, thinking, Is something wrong with him? <laughs> yes. No, something's right with him. And uh, that bird's name was Hystapes. Oh, Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is a name like President or Caesar or something. And that turkey's name was <laughs> Hystapes. What, what would you do if your name was Hystapes? <laughs> and so he gave instructions stop work no more no more and the Lord spoke through Zechariah to Zerubbabel and said it's not by might human might not by power 
but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. When you read it in the Old Testament, that term, the Lord of hosts, do you know what it means? It means the Lord of armies. I've got an army with me. Praise God, the Lord of armies. And just one of those soldiers killed 185,000 Assyrians. That's a powerful army, friend. And he said, this mountain shall be removed. He called that man a mountain. He said, oh, yeah, he's big, all right, but I'm bigger. And in the Hebrew, it, it means, just like, fellas, when you get up in the morning, now, not you, because you got a beard, but uh, not you either. You've got a beard, too. You don't have much hair anywhere, but this <laughs> one. Just hang in there. <laughs> in the Hebrew, it's like you take a straight razor. I've never shaved with a straight razor, and I don't want to. <laughs> and, uh, but you take a straight razor and shave your face. You have to be careful with the thing. You'll cut yourself. Shave your face. And when he said, this mountain shall be removed, and then he said some other things, but it meant, I'm going to take him out, and I'm going to, it's like you shave off a mole off of your face. That's what I'm going to do with him. And in a few months' time, he was dead. And they built that temple. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You serve a big God. You serve a big God. You serve a mighty God. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we've just scratched the surface tonight, Lord, of this great word of Almighty God. But we thank you for your grace. For it's not by might. Oh, give me the, what key are you in? Well, hit me one flat, if you will. What's, no, I'm sorry, give, give, me, give me three flats. Oh, it's not by might not by power but it's by my spirit saith the Lord it's not by might it's not by power but it's by my spirit saith the Lord this mountain shall be removed this mountain shall be removed oh this mountain shall be removed by my spirit saith the Lord here's what I'm going to ask you to do and what I feel led of the Lord to ask you to do I want all, all of you to stand in just a moment when I ask you to there are some of you who have some mountains in your life I don't know what they are we get thousands of emails and letters and and my heart goes out. So many of them, Brother Swaggart, pray that God will give me victory over nicotine. I can't stop cigarettes. Please pray for me. Others with other problems. You say, well, a person can be saved and smoke cigarettes. Well, you're saved and you're judging them. So <laughs> just hang in there. No, I'm not condoning cigarettes. I've never had a cigarette or a cigar in my mouth in my life. But Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. And that thing's a mountain. And I'm not going to ask particularly, I want all of you to stand in. Wherever those mountains are, he'll remove them if you'll allow him to do it. Could you stand, please?